Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to How to Solar Now, our virtual conference on Scenic Hudson's solar mapping tool for your community. Um, this is a follow-up to a conference we had quite a few years ago now, uh, all about planning for solar energy development here in the Hudson Valley. My name is Audrey Friedrichsen. I am the Land Use and Environmental Advocacy Attorney at Scenic Hudson, and I am a member of the team, uh, many of which are joining us tonight to help present to you and uh, answer some questions and show you the use cases uh, for our tool. Um, and just so you know, we are recording this virtual conference and it'll be posted later. Uh, next slide, please, Alex. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar, although I'm sure you probably are, Scenic Hudson uh, is a 50 plus year old uh, environmental organization. We are headquartered in Poughkeepsie, New York. Um, our mission uh, is to preserve land and farms. So we hold a lot of land and fee and an easement. We create parks uh, all up and down the Hudson Valley uh, with the purpose of connecting people with the power of the Hudson River to inspire us. Uh, and at the same time, we do a lot of advocacy work. We fight threats to the river and natural resources that are the foundation of the Valley's prosperity. And of course, on top of that all, we are really working on uh, getting renewable energy cited here and cited well in the Hudson Valley. Next slide, please. Uh, I will just be doing a little bit of housekeeping here, going over the virtual conference agenda for tonight, and then uh, I will set the stage and turn it over to our guest speakers who we're really excited to hear from. So um, the first few uh, minutes here, we'll just uh, finish up the welcome and then we'll turn it over. Um, we're gonna be hearing from Maureen Letty, who is the director of the Office of Climate Change from the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. Uh, Jennifer Manier, who is from NYSERDA, which is the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority, which is doing a lot of work uh, with regard to uh, clean energy siting in New York State. And then we're also gonna get the planner's perspective from Kate Schmidt uh, from the Department of Planning in Orange County. Uh, last I heard, Kate was having a little trouble getting connected, so hopefully she'll be able to join us by then. <clears throat> then what we will do is I will turn it over to my colleague, Alex Wolf, uh, one of the members of the solar mapping tool team. Uh, and he is going to present the tool, show you the use cases, actually uh, go into the tool and show you how it gets used. And during that time, you can type questions into the chat box and uh, we will do our best to take those questions and answer them. And then we're going to have an opportunity for a good 25 minutes or so to go out into uh, breakout groups uh, where we will be talking about three different things. One breakout group is on site selection and analysis. Uh, one is on natural resources considerations um, and other issues like agricultural lands. And then a third breakout will be on planning and zoning for solar. Uh, and just a couple of items with regard to those breakout groups, you were assigned to the breakout topic that you chose when you registered. If you were mistakenly assigned to one that you uh, didn't want to be into, you do have the option to return to the main room and someone can assist you. But we do ask that uh, folks don't jump around. We don't really have the capacity to be able to just uh, be moving uh, large numbers of people from breakout room to breakout room. Uh, and just like with the presentation, please do uh, put your questions into the chat box during the breakout rooms. Although we are going to try and make those sessions obviously a little more interactive um, with smaller groups of people. Uh, and then at the end of the night, we will reconvene uh, and we'll just have a few final remarks. Next slide, please. So just to set the stage here, you might be wondering why, uh, why did we build a solar mapping tool? Um, and this is really related to Scenic Hudson's strategic work in our, in our planning and in the, our interest in strengthening resiliency of the Hudson Valley in the face of climate change. And so in terms of that response to climate change, one of the things that we can do is transition to a sustainable low carbon region, uh, meaning that we get our energy from renewable sources and that in turn can supply clean energy for transportation and buildings. And our real interest here is to help make 
make the Hudson Valley a model of that transition and to do it in a way that we get a rapid build out of these renewable energy sources, but protect our scenic historic agricultural and other resources that we've been working so hard to protect. Uh, next slide, please. And so uh, what we have now put together and made available publicly on our website is a toolkit that we are calling How to Solar Now. Um, th this is uh, to support stakeholder decision making uh, and really in the interest of making that regional model of a response to climate change. And our three main resources in How to Solar Now uh, is our original guide to siting renewable energy in the Hudson Valley uh, that we published a couple of years ago. And from that guide, we pulled out several principles for siting renewable energy, really, in the, again, in the interest of making sure that we don't impact the natural resources uh, that we've worked so hard to protect. Uh, but doing it in a way that maximizes the build out. And the idea behind this is that it will streamline the process, it can reduce costs uh, for developers, but also make sure that we are integrating these projects into our communities in a way that makes sense. And to really, uh, you know, put the shovel in the ground and our money where our mouth is, the next thing that we built is the solar mapping tool. And you'll see tonight that what that does is it provides guidance uh, and information to help um, support decision-making. And then also GIS, Global Information System data is, is mapped. And the user can layer that data and use the guidance to find the best places and the places that make the most sense to put the various kinds of solar energy projects that exist. And finally, uh, we're happy to, to announce uh, tonight that our third tool in the How to Solar Now toolkit, which was called Solar Ready Climate Resilient, uh, which sets out a series of best practices and recommendations for solar zoning in the Hudson Valley. Uh, and that new resource will be discussed a little bit more deeply in, in, in the third breakout. Uh, so that's what How to Solar Now is. Uh, we will be talking about the tool more, but uh, let's hear from our guest speakers, starting with Maureen Letty, um, uh, to sort of set the stage for us and let us know what is going on at the state level in terms of policy and legislation and what it is that is driving this transition to clean energy and uh, why it's so important that we have these tools. So go ahead, Maureen. Thanks so much, Audrey. It's really a pleasure to be here. A few years ago, Audrey and I both participated in the Renewables on the Ground roundtable process that was led by the uh, Alliance for Clean Energy New York and the Nature Conservancy. And I feel like this outcome, this tool is a real, out, like one of the recommendations from that process. And it's really excellent to see something concrete and real and so useful as this come out from that work. So really hats off to Scenic Hudson for the great work they did on this solar siting tool. Uh, so as Audrey mentioned, uh, I'm the director of the Office of Climate Change at DEC. And one of the primary things that the Office of Climate Change works on these days is implementation of the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. So back when Audrey and I were working on renewables on the ground, we were at an ambitious 50 by 30 renewables target and the state was wondering how on earth are we gonna make this happen? Well, we've really, things have changed and the state is, is doubling down, tripling down. We are really getting serious about climate and our response to climate. We now have legislation in place that requires reductions of greenhouse gas emissions that takes our, what were once ambitious goals and puts them into law for renewable energy deployment in the state. And uh, so now we, the DEC in partnership with NYSERDA are the key implementing agencies of the act. Um, and you'll see here on this slide, this is the numbers here, right? We got an 85% reduction below 1990 levels. We're going for a carbon neutral economy in 2050. And all of our um, ambitious, once ambitious goals are now even more ambitious and their requirements to achieve installations of distributed solar energy storage and um, energy efficiency improvements. And then another foundational thing on CLCPA is these commitments to climate justice and just transition. So yeah, we want a world where we're addressing climate change and we wanna make sure that the policies and the programs and the regulations we put in place bring the most benefit to our disadvantaged communities and to our workforce. 
Next slide, please. So the Climate Act is big and sweeping and there's a lot in it and uh, you know really can break down the major roles and responsibilities as such. It, it set forth the Statutory Climate Action Council, which is in process now. They've met a number of times, like, like half a dozen or more. And this Climate Action Council is tasked with developing a scoping plan to achieve those emissions reductions. What is the roadmap to get there to achieve those emissions reductions? It also set the Climate Justice Working Group, which is convened by DEC, and they are tasked with developing a list of criteria to define what it means to be a climate justice disadvantaged community. They're hard at work at that as well. It also set the Just Transition Working Group, which is looking at the workforce implications, making sure displaced workers are not left behind and that there is a good climate friendly green economy that supports our workers. It set forth the uh, requirements of the PSC to establish those renewable energy programs that changed public service law to, you know, to put that, those programs in statute. It gives DEC the authority to promulgate regulations to achieve the emissions reductions requirements, which is, which is big, right? We, have, we always had programs to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. But now we have a regulatory ability to, to reduce, to ensure that our greenhouse gas reductions are achieved. And it also puts out a, a, a authority to all agencies, you know, that they can implement strategies to reduce emissions, that they have to consider consistency with the emissions reductions in their actions. So big, lots of stuff going on. Next slide, please. And the timeline is aggressive, of course, because climate change is a pressing and urgent concern. And we're here now in this draft the plan section. So this sort of divides out of all the stuff that the CLCPA has, what is the in the purview of the Climate Action Council and what is in the purview of agencies. So the, um, the council is working, they have their advisory panels convened, they're developing strategies on how we're going to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions. The PSC is ahead of schedule in putting forth their renewable energy programs. Uh, they had it until the middle of this year, but they put those in place as of the end of last year. And it's all through a very public process where we have to engage with the public, you know, and, and receive lots of comment and make sure that the plan we put forward is workable and supported. And then, we're working towards having our draft plan issued the 1st of January, 2022. So the draft plan goes out for public review at the end of next year, end of this year, early next year, and then a year to deliver the final. And the DEC has to have those regs in place a year after that. So very aggressive timeline. Next slide, please. And as I mentioned, the Climate Action Council convened a series, a set of advisory panels and working groups to support them, to help you know, put big brains together to come up with strategies in all the different sectors where we need to see large emissions reductions. And um, this lays out the, the different advisory panels, their topical areas, you know, and some of their charge. The key to that is common thread that we hear is there needs to be tools and resources for localities to help them understand what it is they need to do and execute on it. And uh, you know, this tool definitely fills that void. You know, this is a, 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 and I really, what I really like about this is the regional approach. Sometimes the, the fragmentation of town by town, you know, it, it becomes very difficult when you're thinking about something like solar. Uh, to, to have a more regional approach to me is, is a lot more sensible so that you're looking at your priorities together, towns are working together, and there's not this like harsh change in policy right on an arbitrary line between one town and another. So the, the regional approach I think is a great one. And I think it's really you know, gonna be very beneficial. So I think that's all I had for slides and, and uh, comments. So I'll pass it back to you, Audrey, to introduce my former colleague and good friend, Jen <laughs> here. Great, thank you so much, Maureen, for joining us tonight and giving us that overview. I think we all realize that we have a big task ahead of us, but, um, you know, and thank you for acknowledging the work that we've been doing. I think we have a lot of partners out there uh, at DEC and they sort of where we're from and planning departments and, you know, landowners and developers and stakeholders, and we're going to get this done. So with that, I will pass it over um, to Jennifer Manier, the Senior Project Manager of Clean Energy Siting uh, at NYSERDA. Jennifer, hey. go ahead. 
All right, I think we're all good. Thank you. So I just wanted to take a, a few minutes and uh, start the timer. I'm not going to go over five, I swear. I just wanted to take a few minutes uh, to tell everyone on the call about a couple of things that we have going on. I figured that anyone who's interested in this webinar would also benefit from a reminder of NYSERDA resources that can actually uh, complement the use of the Scenic Hudson tool. Next slide, please. So one of the, the two roles that I have at NYSERDA, one is on our clean energy siting team. Uh, the, the purpose of that team is to provide support to local governments all across the state to help them prepare for renewable energy development in their towns. Uh, it's particularly useful, our services, for those considering that are those considering adopting zoning laws. Uh, you, might complement that with the scenic Hudson tool to figure out where in your communities is a good fit for solar and make sure the zoning reflects that. So what you see up on the screen here are the are two main guidebooks that we have out and use all the time uh, for local government officials. And over on the right hand side, just sort of a high level list of the different resources that we provide. You can think of us as sort of a, a free state level uh, technical consultant for your community. We can help with uh, payment policies and figuring out different pi pilot arrangements. We can help walk you through the seeker process, adopt clean energy zoning laws, which is sort of what I was just referring to, and maybe one of the best fits with complementing this tool. We can help you out with municipal procurement, adopting our unified solar permit or the slightly newer energy storage permit. Uh, it's super fast. There's a lot more uh, to, to go in there. But in the interest of time, uh, we'll move on to the next slide. So just know that those resources are available. They're all on our website. Uh, pictured here. There's the solar guidebook, energy storage guidebook. We have some wind energy resources, but the most important thing I think to take away from this, in addition to just knowing that those are there for you to download, is knowing that our team is here to answer your questions, any questions that you might have related to clean energy. If we cannot help you, we'll try to find someone who can. So don't hesitate to reach out. You'll see in the middle of the screen here, the box with the red arrow is pointing to our clean energy help at nyserta.ny.gov email address. I swear to you, it does not send your email into an abyss. In fact, it automatically sends an email to every single person on the siting team. And we're pretty good about responding, often even within 24 hours or less. So please reach out to us if you just have a question, if you're interested in us hosting perhaps a workshop for your town board, or maybe you wanna get together with some of the communities around and we can host a workshop for a bunch of different towns at once. We've done things like fire, fire safety trainings for fire departments related to battery energy storage, things like that. So do not hesitate to reach out and know that we're here to support you. It's literally our job. Um, and then one other, a uh, nice sort of resource that I'd like to tell you about, initiative perhaps more so than a resource, if we could go to the next slide, is our new Build Ready program. Some of you may have heard about this, it's relatively new, so maybe a lot of you haven't. But last April, as part of the budget process, the Accelerated Renewable Energy Growth and Community Benefit Act was passed. Uh, it's the same act that created the new Office of Renewable Energy Siting, although this program is completely separate and independent of that. Essentially what the Build Dirty program does is make NYSERDA a renewable energy developer for the first time. We're acting as if we're a private renewable energy developer in many ways. The main difference is that we're targeting underutilized sites across the state that might be good for renewable energy development, but for some impediment that the private sector is not willing or is unable to address, some barrier uh, preventing them from doing that. So we're hoping to target these underutilized sites, bring revenue back into the communities that have those sites just sitting there not generating any revenue, and also offer generous uh, local benefits packages. Uh, th this program is unique for us, because uh, like I said, we're acting as a developer in a way, and ISERT has never done that before. Our services have typically been limited to technical assistance and financial incentives for other folks to do the work. But through Build Ready, we're gonna be identifying sites um, taking them all the way through the design process and permitting process. So for smaller sites, NYSERDA might be an applicant to a town permitting process. For larger ones, NYSERDA would actually end up being an applicant to the new Office of Renewable Energy Siting. And we would design, uh, fully permit, negotiate host community benefit packages, uh, 
put all of that together. And then once the site is fully de-risked and ready for building, we'd auction it off to a private renewable energy developer to build, uh, construct and operate in an ongoing manner. And I think it's worth repeating that that auction package would include any of the benefits that we negotiate with host communities in advance. If we negotiate a pilot agreement or a host community agreement with a community, that is something that's included in that auction package that will have to be transferred along to whichever private renewable energy developer uh, wins the bid, essentially. Um, I think it's pretty important to note, I don't think I even told Scenic Hudson this yet, but our Build Ready team has actually been using the Scenic Hudson tool as part of our top-down statewide assessment of projects that we're looking at. We've gotten, you know, like lists of brownfields from DEC. So we've been looking at hundreds of sites all across the state and trying to screen it out to find the best ones. And uh, the tool has actually been quite helpful for us, one of many in the arsenal, but beneficial nonetheless. So thank you for <laughs> developing the tool that we're finding useful. Um, in addition to that top-down assessment that I just mentioned, we're also looking for bottom-up, uh, welcoming site submissions from quite literally anyone. We have an open RFI on our website. So if you think you know of a site that would be great for Build Ready, we encourage you to submit it to us. And Alex, if you could go to the next slide real quick, I have a a high level list of what makes a good build ready site. Right now we're targeting sites that are 65 acres or larger. It's not a hard cutoff, but it's where we're starting. Um, so 65 acres or larger, uh, they fall into one of the land use types that you see here. Essentially any site that's underutilized is probably a good fit. We're not trying to target you know, farmland and forests for this program. Uh, and then finally, hopefully they have flat or gently sloping terrain. So if you know a site that meets those three criteria, uh, if we could skip to the next slide, please do submit your site through the online RFI for site nominations. It's actually a relatively simple form. I don't think it would take any longer than maybe five or 10 minutes to fill it out. Take a, a screenshot of the parcel you're talking about so we can see it on a map, submit it, and we'll call you up and, and schedule a meeting to talk about it in more detail and see if it looks like a good fit or not. So if we skip to the last slide, uh, that's all I have for now. I wanted to keep it fast, but again, the main take home is reach out to us if you have any questions or need for technical support or think you have a great site for the Build Ready program, we're here. Thank you. So much, Jen, and that is very exciting. I have to say, we're all messaging each other to be like, hey, nice service use of our tool, <laughs> really great. Um, so we're really excited about that. Um, and uh, as I think I mentioned before, we even got online here together, you know, the interest behind this, of course, is smart uh, siting and smart planning. And one of the first principles uh, that we have always highlighted is that the reuse or redevelopment or co-locating of renewable energy projects on previously disturbed areas is the thing that makes the most sense as sort of a first principle of solar energy siting. So we're really uh, glad glad and supportive of NYSERDA's efforts to really try and uh, streamline that process and facilitate the reuse of sites that make sense, but might otherwise be cost prohibitive or have other problems. So our last speaker of the day is Kate Schmidt. I know I saw her on the list, but then I'm not sure if she is still on the list. So I'm going to uh, be quiet now and ask Kate if you are there and if you can hear us and if you can speak and go ahead. I am here, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Great. That's great. Thank you. Um, all right. So I don't have slides. I didn't make the deadline. So I'm just going to be talking quickly. You all can sit back, relax, close your eyes. Just don't fall asleep. I was asked to provide um, the local perspective. So because I'm the sustainability coordinator and a land use planner for Orange County, we've been seeing solar from the beginning. Um, as, as many county planning departments participate in the New York State General Municipal Law 239 process, that's when you get to see village and town um, development proposals, special use permits, local zoning amendments, um, all within uh, 500 feet of state and county roads, property, parkland, intermunicipal boundaries. So simply by reviewing hundreds of these applications annually, we found ourselves on the precipice of the Hudson Valley Solar Revolution. Um, having studied so the feasibility of solar since the mid 90s, I was downright giddy when the application started rolling into our office in the mid to late aughts. 
Um, at first, the applications were small, mostly residential or demonstration projects, but then the state began offering numerous financial um, incentives and educational programs such as Solarize New York and Orange got on board, we were the first county to participate in, a solar, in the first round of the Solarize program and we led the state for the highest number of solar systems. Um, but we were not so fortunate our second time at that a few years later. Very few interested folks pulled the trigger and invested in photovoltaics. Uh, it seemed everyone was solared out as the Chamber of Commerce explained to me. Um, there was no more desire for solar. It happened so quickly and no one really knew why. But the state continued to roll out different programs and incentives such as community solar. The solar farm started coming. But as a heavily agricultural county, we changed that name quickly to solar facilities. Um, we couldn't call them solar farms anymore. And these facilities started small, you know, around 600 kilowatts, but folks um, started to take notice when in the town of Minisink on Route 1, there was a megawatt project on one side of the road and directly across another one. So this finally got people's attention. And of course, then the municipal officials um, started paying attention. We had been trying to educate these elected and appointed officials to prepare their municipal code for the onslaught of solar arrays for a while and were largely ignored. But as a result, the municipalities started rushing to protect themselves with solar moratoria and those uh, moratoria just extended their um, uh, time frames over and over again in a way to figure out how to protect their villages and towns from these large unfamiliar um, arrays. Orange County was inundated with solar facility applications. And remember, we only received the applications that are happening within 500 feet of the aforementioned criteria. There were so many more proposed systems that we were not even aware of. Um, so we learned that Orange County was the indeed solar sweet spot of the state. Energy was generated very close to the biggest demand, New York City. Our proximity minimized transmission losses. We have lots of abundant and readily available large, relatively open tracts of land that were recently farmed. And we have aging farmers in need of a financial boost through leased land, reduced utility cost, or both. So I need you all to put yourself in a planning board member's position for a moment. Here is a tax generating project that is not permanent since the parcel owner could technically reinvent the project after the solar's typical 20 year lease ends. It generates no traffic. It requires no emergency services, police rarely fire, um, or social services, no school aged children to increase the school budget, no impervious pavement, no emissions to degrade local air quality. So municipal officials open the doors for these projects and they open the doors wide without considering other important elements that should be included in every land use review project. Our department continues to advise municipalities to protect themselves by updating their municipal code and local laws to address concerns such as solar zoning, solar battery storage, roadway degradation, wetland and stream protection, fencing and how it affects wildlife access and how that burdens surrounding neighbors. Appropriate year round screening that includes planting a variety of species of trees and to be sure to include bat friendly trees. Tree management plans, municipalities should adopt a maximum ceiling or percentage of tree clearing allowed for solar or all development. In addition, tree replacement formulas should be adopted for developments. Basically land should not be clear cut for solar development. Um, vegetation around wetlands need to remain in order to maintain the health of the wetland. Removing crucial nearby vegetation will result in significant heat gain and the slow demise of the wetland. Um, mandatory second uses such as pollinator friendly vegetation. Um, heights of this vegetation usually do not exceed the bottom of the panels. So the air quality is improved since there is no need to mow and there is a cost savings. The county pays, the county for our one plus megawatt system, we pay over $6,000 a year for annual mowing. So you can imagine how much more these larger sites are paying. Another secondary use is grazing. Our office reminds applicants that their agricultural assessments may be at risk should a solar array be installed. Mandating grazing as secondary use on the property can avoid the potential loss of the agricultural assessment and the possible expulsion from the county ag district. 
Lastly, banning the use of herbicides that will leak into local waterways and could jeopardize these properties that were once productive farms from returning to an agricultural use when the solar lease expires. Our office does not stand alone. In 2018, the Orange County Agricultural and Farmland Protection Board adopted a new policy strongly advising municipalities to avoid siting solar on designated prime agricultural soils or of statewide um, significance. Uh, we also have the New York State pass the Pollinator Friendly Solar Act in 2018, establishing a statewide vegetation standard for the ground under and around solar arrays to be planted with low, low growing flowering plants and native grasses. And as mentioned in the model solar energy local law guidebook, New York states that tree removal should not be minimized. It has to be considered. Um, these are all especially important now given the, basically the accelerated siting act as I call it, because the other title is just too long for me to master. Our office hopes to um, offer solar education training and template language along with continued outreach to help municipalities expedite the adoption of these protection measures. We're currently preparing a natural resource inventory and NRI map for all 43 municipalities and hope to incorporate scenic huts and solar toolkit in an effort to drive all development to appropriate locations. I'm starting to see some progress on um, proposed projects that come into our office now. I'll see a few notes that will say, um, you know, no herbicides will be used and that they voluntarily um, consider tree plantings and they'll include wildlife passings through the fencing occasionally. But I am teeming with joy and excitement about scenic Hudson's amazing feat. This map is a game changer for the entire Hudson Valley landscape. Um, it will help municipalities direct solar facilities to logical places where it makes sense and where it needs to be. Thank you. Um, and on that note, thank you so much, Kate, for that uh, vote of confidence for what we built. And, and really, that is the whole point here is to uh, inform decision making uh, by the people who have those decisions uh, in front of them. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Alex Wolf. Uh, thank you one more time to all of our guest speakers this evening. We really set the stage for this. Um, and uh, I'm going to turn it over to Alex and we will see what the tool is all about. Go ahead. Hey, thank you, Audrey, and, and thanks to all our speakers. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to jump right into it here. Um, as Audrey mentioned, the solar mapping tool is one of the three resources in our How To Solar Now toolkit, and we see it as an educational resource um, that we hope is going to guide exploration and prioritization of sites and solar planning um, and help inform the conversation and help municipal stakeholders, uh, solar developers, agencies all get on the same page, all have a common starting point, um, be looking at the same data when they start considering solar planning and siting. We envision three main use cases for the tool, um, supporting comprehensive planning and zoning for solar, assessing specific sites for potential solar development, uh, at least as a first pass, and hopefully people will be able to use this tool to set community renewable energy goals as well as they try to um, meet, uh, create climate action plans and, and meet renewable energy goals. Uh, the tool is developed with input from lots of different stakeholders, uh, many of whom are on the call uh, this evening. Um, we, they, were, they were all hugely instrumental in helping us figure out what needed to be in this tool and how to present different topics. We also pilot tested the tool with two Hudson Valley communities, the towns of Chatham and Lloyd, which were, uh, they were also hugely helpful in, in helping us make this tool the best it could be. Uh, the tool is an interactive web map, as you'll see shortly, um, and it has these map data layers or these information layers that, that are laid, layered on top of each other in a map um, so that you can see where all of these resources are. And we have a number of different uh, layers in the tool that are organized into our layer groups sort of thematically, as you see here. Um, and of course, there are, there are tons and tons of data layers out there in the world, freely available for everybody to use. Um, <clears throat> We wanted to really hone into the ones that made the most sense to include in this map. Um, we wanted to do, use ones that were appropriate for the scale of municipalities in the Hudson Valley um, and that had a really clear relation to uh, solar development and be able to explain how they related to solar development. 
And we also wanted the layers that are, are sort of most useful for each single resource. Um, so for example, there are a lot of different uh, layers to represent farm soils. And we worked with agricultural experts and farmers um, and, and the state uh, agriculture markets agency to figure out what the single best soil layer is to represent farm soils in the tool uh, to reduce complexity and make, make all this information easier to digest. There are three main parts to the solar mapping tool. And the first three are really educational in nature. The fourth is where the user gets to apply what they've learned in the first three parts and really has the full functionality of the maps at their fingertips. So I'm just gonna give a brief overview of the four parts, explain what they are and, and how they're different. Um, part one is, is really background information on solar, on solar energy systems and the type that you're likely to see in the Hudson Valley. Um, there are other types of solar energy that are developed in say the desert Southwest. Uh, we're not gonna see some of those technologies here, some we will. Um, and throughout the tool, we have information on the left-hand side here, and we have these dark blue buttons that we call info dive. So if you wanted more detail about solar energy systems, um, you could click that and then scroll down on the right, and uh, you can dive into the details a little more, or you can keep going and move on to the next topic if you like. Um, we find that a lot of people, myself included, when I started learning about solar, have a hard time understanding how kilowatts and megawatts, which is how solar projects are often uh, stated in terms of their size, how does that actually translate to a development, solar development on the ground? And so we have some examples. Uh, we have common, common buckets uh, that these, these projects tend to get binned into, and then we have examples from each bucket. So for instance, if somebody says two megawatts and, and you're trying to picture that in your head, um, you can click this button and actually see a two megawatt project that was built in Saugerties uh, with the Catskills there in the background. Um, now, as, as has been alluded to by our, our previous speakers, uh, we feel that land use planning is really the place to start when you want to start thinking about solar and solar development. Um, and so uh, actually Audrey developed the four steps for smart solar planning, um, which really sort of frames our approach to how to think about solar development in the Hudson Valley. It's using these four steps and these four steps, which are detailed in part two, form the framework of parts three and four in the solar mapping tool. Um, we also talk about the benefits of why uh, smart solar planning is so important for communities. Um, as Kate mentioned, we're seeing, you know, in some places a real onslaught of solar development proposals. Communities don't always have the tools to understand what's being proposed or what questions they might want to ask about it. So we have a lot of discussion in the solar mapping tool about the things you want to be thinking about. Um, we have another uh, info dive uh, in this section about energy justice. Um, as was mentioned by previous speakers, this is a critical component of the CLCPA, the Climate Act. Um, and, and energy justice is sort of an offshoot of environmental justice that really deals with making sure that disadvantaged communities both see the benefits of solar development, like increased jobs, cheaper and cleaner energy, um, and aren't subjected to um, sort of decisions being foisted upon them, as was often done with fossil fuel development, where they have these dirty plants creating pollution in their communities and often don't see the benefits. Um, so we hope that, you know, the solar revolution is going to aid a lot of these communities to get, get cleaner energy, have more job opportunities, and this info dive discusses some of the, the aspects of how to go about actually making that happen. Finally, in part two, we talk about what we were hoping users will bring to the table. Um, this map covers the entire Hudson Valley, many counties, and we can't possibly cover all the details. There are always gonna be local, local uh, pieces of information that users need to bring to the table. So natural resource inventories, comprehensive plans, um, similar documents, local knowledge of on the ground conditions, um, all maps are wrong in some sort of a way. Um, and there are also things that these maps can't possibly be detailed enough to represent. So the, the communities using them have to know their own communities pretty well and particularly know their values and their priorities. There's a huge diversity of communities in the Hudson Valley um, and they all have different sort of resources. They all have different priorities, different community values. And you, you know, we want you to bring that to the table. We didn't want to create a static map that tells people, you know, this one spot is where you should put solar, but rather, give local stakeholders the tools to find the best places using their values, uh, the information they have and the information we're providing here. 
So part three is learn about the layers. As I mentioned, there are a lot of data layers in this tool. Um, it's a huge amount of information. And so what we do with part three is introduce these layers one by one with interactive maps. Um, and we use these four steps of smart solar planning as a framework to do that. We also have what we call our worksheet, um, which you can download and print, or you can download and type into. Um, and that's basically just the outline for part three um, with a few extra bits of information, but basically with space for you to write notes so that if you notice an interesting resource, if you learn an interesting fact, um, if you want to look into something and overlay some different layers, you can take notes on that as you go through part three and then, you know, reapply those notes in part four. Uh, so part one, uh, or sorry, step one of smart solar planning is to assess existing development patterns. And we have a land cover map to help folks do that. Uh, if you've never seen one of these, we have another info dive here. So you can learn how to read these maps. But the basic idea is that, you know, red areas are more developed clusters. The yellows and browns are open areas, mostly uh, agricultural areas in the Hudson Valley, some grasslands. And then we have forests and greens, wetlands and water resources and blues. And so when you zoom out to your whole town, you get a real sense of where the development clusters are, where the, the agricultural clusters are, if there are any, where the, the large forest blocks are, where your transportation corridors. And hopefully, you know, this map is aligned well with your zoning and your planning documents. Um, but you can use this to sort of look at your town as a whole and think about where you wanna, you know, what you want your town to look like in the future. Um, and really that, that having that vision of, of the future and of, of what you want your town to be is key to any sort of smart growth planning, including smart solar planning. Step two is identifying solar opportunity areas. Um, these again were mentioned by other speakers. Uh, these are the old mines, the landfills, uh, the, the super fun sites, places that you really you know, don't, don't want to do something with or that are just sitting vacant right now, but could be a great spot for solar. And so we have three data sets in here. One is from the Environmental Protection Agency called Repowering Opportunities. Um, that's the diamonds on the map here. And you can click on them and get information about remediation sites. They've pulled both um, EPA and DEC data on uh, contaminated sites. And you can get more information on what the site was contaminated and remediated for, whether it's suitable for housing development or not, for instance, whether it has safe drinking water or not. Um, really useful details thinking about what that site should be going forwards. And the EPA also has some, some screening data available at this link. Um, to see how much solar they think may be suitable on this site. The other opportunity that we're really trying to highlight is rooftop solar and parking lots. Um, we found a build, building footprint uh, data set. And so we're highlighting large buildings here, which of course often come with, with parking lots. Uh, so you can see there's a 17 acre building here. Um, that's quite a lot of, of real estate. And zooming in a bit, um, this 17 acre building is actually the Poughkeepsie Galleria Mall. There's some other very large retail spaces here and a, and a huge parking lot. And within that box is almost 150 acres of impervious surface. And you could put solar all over the parking lots. You could put solar all over the rooftops, assuming the engineering works out. And you haven't impacted the retail. You haven't impacted the parking. In fact, you've probably made shadier parking spots that need less snow plowing. Um, so really win-win situations here. And these, you know, we hope are the things that people will look for first when they're thinking, thinking about where solar should go in their communities. Step three of smart solar planning is to identify locations that avoid your valued resources and, and negatively impacting them. Uh, so what's a valued resource? That's up to your community, but it's things like agricultural lands, natural resources, clean water, um, historic, cultural, outdoor recreation sites, things like that. And so we have lots of data layers to represent these and we go through them again one by one with interactive maps um, and we've sort of grouped them. So uh, for instance, agriculture, we have a few different layers to show people. And we have another info dive. There is some nuance here. Um, farmers tend to like flat lands with a lot of sunshine and solar developers tend to like the same. And so while some people see a lot of room for competition there, there is also a lot of room for cooperation and what we call co-location. And so we have an info dive about that, about effective ways to fit together farming and solar in ways that help both grow instead of making both compete. Um, just one example of some of the agricultural data layers um, is uh, the farmland soils. Uh, <clears throat> we also have several layers for biodiversity and habitat. Um, shown here is, is forest cores. What is a forest core and what should you think about that? Um, we have an info dive to get in, into the weeds, if you'll forgive the pun, on that as well. 
Uh, we also address water resources and we have uh, more info dives where there is, is uh, nuance to those. Um, and that's uh, so that sort of gets us through uh, part three, looking at our valued resources, learning where those are in the community and how those relate to solar development. Uh, step four is uh, assessing development feasibility. And this is the place where a lot of solar developers often start. It makes perfect sense from a technological and an economic sense. Um, but we really hope that people will stop and think first about what their community priorities are and where the best places in their community are to fit solar. Um, and that's that's why we've made this step four. Uh, there are a few sort of technical data layers that go along with assessing solar feasibility. Uh, the first is slope and aspect, or what we call landforms. Um, so this data layer just reflects basically the terrain. Um, bluer areas are flatter, more south facing, better for solar. The red areas are less feasible. So you can see, um, and this layer is really best sort of zoomed out at the townwide uh, scale. You get a, a pretty good sense of where in your town, city, village, um, the, the really hilly steep areas are that are going to be less suitable for solar versus those flatter areas that are going to be more suitable. We also have a data layer for hosting capacity, um, and this refers to distribution lines. So if you hear about distribu uh, distributed energy or a distributed solar project, that's tapping into these distribution lines. These are the lines that bring power to your house, to your work. Um, they're smaller size lines uh, that go from substations to buildings. And basically hosting capacity is how much spare room there is on a given segment of that line to add solar power without overloading the circuit. Um, this tends to be higher by substations. There's a substation here in Rhinebeck Village. And as you go further away from that substation, uh, you have less hosting capacity generally. Uh, this is a, a pretty loose proxy, and if you actually want to develop solar, then the solar developer and the utilities have to do interconnection studies. But this gives you an idea of the places that are already probably suitable uh, and probably have the infrastructure to support distributed solar projects versus not. Um, as I said, a bit of a technical subject, so we do have another info dive here. Um, you can learn how to read these maps, what all the numbers mean, what you should think about them. Uh, transmission lines, these are the big ones that go in between, you know, long distances in between substations. Uh, if you're talking about utility scale solar or often called large scale solar, these are the projects where uh, solar developers are selling whole, wholesale electricity directly to utilities. Um, they need transmission lines and they tend to be, uh, they tend to want to site their projects right along transmission lines. So. When you're thinking about larger projects, you tend to want to uh, locate where these transmission lines are in your municipality, and that will give you a clue as to where might be better for these larger projects. So finally, part four is um, putting it all together. This is where the rubber meets the road. The user has full controls. Uh, part three is one layer at a time. This is all the layers all at once. Um, and we've added some more bells and whistles that folks can use. Uh, if you forget what all the layers were, we have some quick help buttons. Uh, excuse me. Yep. So, um, so this is the, sorry, the tools and functions button um, that shows you what all these widgets do and where they are on the screen. Um, I will highlight this link button here, which gets you to a number of different places, including the help document for the whole solar mapping tool. So that can be a, a big help. We have our layer groups down here. Um, if you can't remember what all those icons stand for, uh, you can click this quick help button here and have a key for those. Um, and we do have the list of all the data layers as well, if needed. Um, so to actually turn on and off layers, um, you can mouse over these layer groups and it will highlight uh, what, what that icon stands for. So this is solar opportunity layers. If I were to click there in the live tool, it would bring up my three solar opportunity layers. Um, you can expand these little triangles here to get a key for what these are. And you can turn all these layers on and off and overlay whatever layers you want. Uh, I will point out we're zoomed out right now. And so these, these layers are all grayed out because you can't see them when you're zoomed this far out. If I were to zoom in on the live demo, uh, these layers would all turn on and the labels would turn black. Uh, that's how you know you should be seeing them. The last thing I'm gonna point out um, on this, this demo is uh, if you scroll down on the left-hand side here in part four, we have a few examples. And these are just uh, sort of um, 
suggestions of a few different layers you might want to turn on at once and overlay and what you might want to be thinking about or asking yourself while you're turning on this particular combination of layers. So there are four examples here. Um, you can go through as many as you like. Um, and a lot of times we have callbacks. So here we're telling you to turn on hosting capacity. If you need a reminder for how to interpret the hosting capacity layer, you can click on that and get back to the info dive. I do just want to cover quickly before we go to questions, a few other things. Um, and I want to be clear about what, what the solar mapping tool is and isn't intended to be. Um, if this is an educational tool, we hope it's going to guide learning and inform the discussion. Um, this, we really tried to distill a huge amount of information that is at times quite complex. Um, and we're, we're piling lots of different data sets all in one place. Um, almost every data layer in the tool you can go find in another online mapper, um, but they don't always explain explicitly how they relate to solar and you can't overlay them. Um, so that's, that's where we think the value added here is with, with the solar mapping tool. Um, we didn't want to design something that spits out concrete answers, but rather uh, helps you think through what you, you want the answer to be for your community. Um, this doesn't replace local knowledge. You have to bring that to the table. Um, this is not a replacement for regulatory site review. So you still need to go through your, your uh, board applications, your seeker applications, et cetera. Um, we couldn't possibly, of course, cover every topic in detail or provide all available data sets on a given topic. But again, we hope we picked the one most useful thing to show you in this mapper for each, each of these topics. Finally, I do want to mention quickly uh, our replication guide. This tool covers the Hudson Valley, um, but most of the data layers are available statewide or nationwide. And so for folks with uh, some, some technical savvy, this tool could quite easily be recreated uh, for another region. And we've put a guide on our How to Solar Now website um, that'll help you sort of think through how to do that and, and provide some, some guidance on, on recreating the tool for other regions. So I, um, I think we're going to move to uh, our Q&A session now. Um, thanks for bearing with us through uh, a lot of talking at you. Thanks so much, Alex. And yeah, we'll be moving over to questions and answers. And just a reminder that you can put any questions you might have in the chat, and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can. We've already gotten a whole bunch of questions come in. So um, I know people are to get more information. So we'll just take it from the top uh, in the order in which we receive the questions. Um, so the first question is, what happens when uh, a solar uh, facility is closed and the company moves out? How is the site restored at that point? Or what happens to the materials that were used, like the solar panels themselves, once that facility is no longer operational? Audrey, do you want to do you want to take that one? Sure, and thanks, Alex. Uh, yeah, I know that that is probably a concern for many communities. I know that is probably related to concerns uh, from other types of development, for instance, cell towers um, or uh, other, sorry, starting my video, here I am, uh, cell towers or other kinds of development where the concern is, you know, what happens if this use, which is sort of a temporary use, uh, the owner either folds up shop or the use is, is no longer needed, what happens at the end? And decommissioning of a solar energy project and their lifetime can be anywhere from 20 to 40 years is something that we address in our new uh, zoning handbook. Um, and at the end of its use, uh, the developer might be able to do one of several things. They might uh, replace the panels and then it can continue uh, to operate. But if they do decide to take it down, uh, one of the things that is kind of interesting is that because the soil remains uh, fallow underneath, uh, perhaps it's then uh, can be returned to agricultural use um, or other kinds of use. And I know that the Solar Energy Industry Association has been paying close attention to the fact that once these kinds of projects have lived their useful lives, Lives, there is going to be some materials that need to be recycled. So there is a recycling program in the United States that has begun. And not only can panels be recycled, but they do maintain some amount of efficiency and usability. And so they might be able to be used in a different kind of installation, perhaps elsewhere or even uh, in another country. Thanks, Audrey. And the next question we have, which I think was answered in the chat, but maybe we can just answer it again if people weren't reading the chat, which is, 
what is the data source for the land cover map? Sure. Um, the land cover map is actually a nationally available uh, data set. It comes from the um, federal government. I believe the uh, U.S. Geological Survey works with the U.S. Department of Agriculture, if I'm not mistaken, to come up with the um, national land cover uh, data set. And so that that is a nationally available uh, data set. And that one is pretty coarse. Um, in other words, it's it's made for the entire US and the, the pixels on it are pretty big. So in our tool, it will actually turn off if you zoom in too far um, because it's really gets to be a little bit inaccurate by the time you've zoomed in really far. Um, but when you're looking at your municipality as a whole, I think it's really useful for revealing overall patterns of growth and land use. And that's that's where we're sort of expecting folks will use it. Thanks, Alex. And I think you had answered another question from one of our audience members about the reliability of that data set. So that was really helpful to know, you know where it's useful and where it might not be so useful. Uh, the next question we have is how do we layer our existing town maps, for example, natural resources onto this tool? And that's probably another one for you, Alex. Sure. Um, we, we, unfortunately, we don't have the capability right now to add more sort of to let towns add their individual data into the tool. Um, that sort of technologically was, was a bit much for us to try to figure out um, in this iteration of the tool. And so unfortunately, towns are left with sort of pulling up their the maps that they have on, on one screen or printing them out while they're using the solar mapping tool. Um, not ideal. But we have taken a number, you know, all of the layers that we do have in the map allow you to, to overlay things. And so hopefully you'll have two maps in your hand instead of 20 maps in your hand. Um, so unfortunately, we weren't able to accommodate everybody. But the, the, you know, the task of getting data for all of the, you know, hundreds of communities in the Hudson Valley was a little bit too, too great for us to tackle. Um, we are hoping that, that the solar mapping tool could be used to inform natural resource inventories, open space plans, et cetera, so that going forward, um, those will be combined into singular documents and, and each will inform the other iteratively. Um, same with comp plans, comprehensive plans. Thanks, and our next question is, are these maps or these data sets updated? If so, how often? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so the way the to give you a little peek into the back end, um, most of these layers are streamed from the people from the agencies or the organizations who create them. Um, a great advantage of this technology is that we can stream other people's data layers in. So for instance, that EPA repowering data set um, comes directly from EPA. So whenever EPA updates it, then it will update in the solar mapping tool. Um, likewise, most of these other layers. And the, the sources for these, all of these layers are available in the data sources document. And where we can, we've given an indication of what the latest update was or how often they may be updated if we have that information. But oftentimes it's up to the source organization or agency. Um, hopefully because they're streaming in, we're always gonna have the most up-to-date publicly available layer, layers that they're, they're available. Great, thank you. And I think we've got time for just a couple more questions here before we go to our breakout rooms. Um, and just to let everyone know if you have a question and it doesn't end up getting answered, please feel free to reach out to us after the fact and we'll do our best to answer it if we can. Um, so the next question is, does siting of medium or large size solar projects depend on proximity to power lines and the electric grid? Yes, very much so. Um, <laughs> particularly large, uh, those large energy projects that I was talking about. So that's typically above about five megawatts. Um, and we expect something like five to six acres per megawatt. Um, those projects, those utility scale projects, the, the number we've heard sort of thrown around loosely is a million dollars per mile for, for new line if you want to build new line. And from the few large projects that have been proposed in the Hudson Valley, we are seeing developers locate them right along transmission lines. So when you're talking about large scale projects, expect them to, you know, I would say at least thus far, they're, they've generally been right along transmission lines. The smaller projects, those distributed, distributed energy projects, um, obviously have smaller interconnection costs. And again, that's going to be ho those hosting capacity layers that uh, 
people should look at and, and the developers will be looking at to figure out the cost effectiveness of how far they can get from a line and a substation. Um, but at the end of the day, it comes down to the interconnection study that the developer needs the utility to do to get into the nitty gritty of, of the, the actual numbers. And I think this is going to be the final question we'll have time for today so we can all uh, get into our breakout groups and delve more deeply into our specific topics. Again, please feel free to reach out with any questions that we weren't able to answer today. Um, but this is a good one, an important one. Is this uh, program or tool intuitive to learn or do users need some GIS training on how to review and interpret the data layers? If so, are trainings available? That's a great question. We uh, really strived and, and did our absolute best to make this tool as user friendly as could be. Um, we do have those quick help buttons throughout the tool and we do have that help document um, that's linked to in a number of different places. But our intent was that if you can use the internet, you should be able to use this tool. You do not need any prior GIS knowledge or expertise. You don't need any software. You just pull, our, pull up our website and you, can, you should be able to click through uh, with minimal problems. Great, thanks. And I think we will uh, try to go out into our breakout rooms now. So you should be put into the breakout room that you selected at this point. And again, if you end up in the wrong room, um, please feel free to go back to the main room and we'll make sure you get where you need to go. <laughs> All right, so I think uh, we have uh, pretty much reached the end of the evening. Hopefully everybody uh, enjoyed their breakout rooms. I know uh, for mine, I did the usual, a lot of talking. Hopefully it was uh, useful for everyone and uh, was able to answer some of their questions or at least uh, provide them with some beginning information to do some more uh, research in those particular areas, but most importantly to, you know, come back and go to our howtosolarnow.org website and take a deeper dive into the tools that we provide uh, for you there. Uh, we really thank everybody for joining us today. Um, and, you know, we're really hoping that everyone will uh, participate, you know, in our vision for trying to really make the Hudson Valley a model of um, that transition to renewable energy. Uh, and we find it's, it's very important to meet the goals uh, of the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. And, you know, we think we can do that. We think we can do it in a smart way uh, with solar projects and other renewable energy projects that are well cited and can be built into the landscape in a way that makes sense. Um, you know, for our part, uh, our next steps with regard to the tool and our other resources is that we will be most likely looking to partner with a few communities going forward who are looking to do a deeper dive uh, and really look to apply the tool in their community as they plan for solar development, maybe even um, you know, adopt a new solar code. Uh, so we will be, you know, probably uh, providing information and recording meetings or giving summaries of how we do that. And we'll be happy to share that to, with others. Uh, because again, what we're trying to do is make this a model. Um, and we would really like to see using that replication guide that our tool uh, gets built uh, for other regions of the state and even across the country. Uh, so that we can sort of achieve this uh, on, a, on a countrywide basis. And I think the information is up there still. If you do have any questions going forward, um, you know, with regard to the tool or anything else like that, Carly Fraccaroli was our uh, advocacy associate here at Scenic Hudson and a great member of our team in building the tool. You can direct questions to her and she can either uh, answer them or find somebody who can do that. So I think that is us, uh, it for us this evening, uh, unless everybody else, I, I see that we are getting uh, in the chat room a lot of thank yous from people and, and you know, letting us know uh, that this is interesting and useful and that is uh, really good feedback for us to get on sort of such short no notice. Um, and so hopefully everybody will, will sign in and take a look at that tool, maybe not all at once, um, uh, so that the tool doesn't get overloaded, uh, but that it can be used going forward. So thanks very much, everybody, and have a good evening.